Behind the fortified walls, an intricate and often controversial story unfolds, revealing a struggle for justice and equality. I am here to uncover the challenges, victories, and complex experiences of transgender women within the prison system. Here is the fate of transgender women in prisons. Demi Minor. First, let's delve into the shocking and captivating life of transgender woman Demi Minor, who finds herself in the confines of a prison. Demi's story has become the center of a heated debate after being moved to a men's prison for impregnating two fellow female inmates. Despite her actions, Demi firmly believes she should be housed with females and has been documenting her experiences through her blog, shedding light on the physical and psychological abuse she claims to have endured in the men's facility. Let's dive in. Demi Minor's journey into the prison system is rooted in a troubled past that culminated in a shocking act of violence. Born as Demetrius, Demi had a record of burglaries and even committed a carjacking at gunpoint. However, the most horrifying chapter of her life unfolded in 2011 when she brutally stabbed her foster father, Theotis Ted Butts, 27 times. The murder scene was described as one of the worst ever witnessed, with blood splattered everywhere. The community was outraged, as Ted Butts was considered a great guy an angel. This heinous crime thrust Demi Minor into the spotlight, and her name became synonymous with cold-blooded murder. The tragedy of her actions reverberated throughout the community, leaving a lasting impact on those who knew Ted Butts. Brad Wertheimer, one of Minor's defense lawyers at the time, expressed his shock at the scene, stating that it was the worst murder scene he had ever seen. After the murder of her foster father, Demi Minor's life took a dramatic turn as she found herself behind bars. Currently serving a 30-year sentence for manslaughter and carjacking, Demi's time in prison has been marked by a series of controversial events. One of the most significant controversies surrounding Demi's incarceration is her desire to be housed in a women's facility. Despite being assigned to a women's prison initially, Demi was later removed from the state's lone facility for females when it was discovered that she had impregnated two fellow inmates. This revelation led to her transfer to a lockup where she is the only person identifying as female. Demi, now a transgender woman, is fighting for her return to a women's prison under a new and controversial state policy policy that allows inmates to be housed according to their preferred gender identity. Her legal team argues that she should be housed with females, aligning with her gender identity. I mean, I've had issues with, with certain inmates who, you know, um, as soon as I got there, they grabbed me inappropriately, or I've had issues with inmates who have, like, misgendered me, and that's caused me to be, you know, to feel very, you know, upset, you know, where my pronouns are she, her, and then the person continues to call you he. This issue has sparked intense debate and raised questions about the rights and safety of both transgender inmates and the female inmates with whom they may be housed. Demi's case has become a focal point for discussions on the complexities of gender identity within the prison system. Her push to be housed in a women's prison has garnered mixed reactions from those who have been a part of her life. One prominent voice against Demi's cause is her former foster mother, Dr. Wanda Broach Butts. Driven by the pain of losing her husband to Demi's Demi's violent act. Wanda believes that Demi is using her transgender status as a manipulative ploy to gain special treatment and attention in jail. She describes Demi as a psychopath and expresses concerns for the safety of female inmates if Demi is returned to a women's prison. On the other hand, Demi has garnered support from various individuals and organizations. Her new lawyer, Derek Demiri, an advocate for the LGBTQ community, admires her ability to navigate the system and sees her as a triumph. Demi's supporters view her as a victim of the foster care system and a prison system that discriminates against black transgender women. They argue that her fight for justice extends beyond her case and seeks to address the injustices faced by black trans females within the foster and criminal punishment systems. Notably, Demi's cause has attracted the attention of Mike Isaacson, a former professor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and a member of Antifa. Isaacson, who has a history of making provocative anti-police statements, has thrown his support behind Demi. However, his involvement has also sparked controversy due to his controversial remarks and affiliations. The contrasting opinions of Demi's former foster mother, Dr. Wanda Brochbutz, and her supporters highlight the complexity of the situation and the differing perspectives on Demi's transgender identity and her fight for justice within the prison system. It is clear that her story elicits strong emotions and sparks intense debates. From her troubled past and the shocking murder of her foster father to her desire to be housed in a women's facility and the reactions of her former foster mother and supporters, Demi's journey has been marked by controversy and complex issues surrounding gender identity and the prison system.
victim, Dion Hampton. Next, we'll dive into the life of Dion Hampton during her time in prison. Dion, also known as Strawberry, endured unimaginable abuse and discrimination within the Illinois Department of Corrections. Dion Hampton's time in prison was marked by a relentless cycle of abuse and mistreatment, leaving her scarred both physically and emotionally. From the moment she entered the prison system, she faced unimaginable horrors solely because of her gender identity as a transgender woman. As a 28-year-old transgender woman, Dion, also known as Strawberry, had identified as trans since the age of five. When she was sentenced to 10 years for residential burglary in 2015, she repeatedly requested to be sent to a women's facility. However, her pleas fell on deaf ears, and she found herself in a men's prison, where her nightmare began. From the very first day, Dion was subjected to verbal and physical abuse by both fellow inmates and prison staff. Beatings became a daily occurrence, leaving her battered and bruised. But the abuse didn't stop there. Dion's clothes were cut off with a knife, leaving her exposed and vulnerable. She was dragged with shackles on her feet, and arms treated as less than human. In the prison, Dayon felt like a sex slave, constantly subjected to the predatory behavior of both prisoners and staff. The very people who were supposed to protect her became her tormentors. She endured sexual abuse, inappropriate touching, and groping, all while living in constant fear for her safety. Despite the ongoing abuse, Dayon's resilience and determination to survive never wavered. She fought to maintain her sense of self and dignity in the face of unimaginable cruelty. But the abuse took its toll, leaving deep emotional scars that would haunt her long after her release. Basically, we have no rights. We're animals, we're creeps, we're f***s, we're sissies, and abomination to God. And this is according to whom? Administration, directors, warnings, staff. Dayon's pleas for help and justice were disregarded within the prison system. When she spoke up about the abuse, guards retaliated by physically assaulting her and writing her up for bad behavior. These false accusations further delayed her release, prolonging her suffering and denying her the freedom she so desperately sought. It wasn't until November 2018 that Dayon was finally transferred to a women's prison. While this provided some respite from the constant abuse, it was far from a perfect solution. The scars of her past experiences remained, and the trauma she endured continued to haunt her. Throughout her time in various facilities, including Menard, Dion was denied privileges that were granted to other inmates. She was denied access to jobs, education, and socialization, further isolating her from the outside world. The prison system failed to recognize her as a woman, denying her the basic rights and opportunities afforded to others. Despite the immense challenges she faced, Dion's spirit remained unbroken. Determined to hold the Illinois Department of Corrections, I don't accountable for the abuse she endured, she took legal action to shed light on the systemic mistreatment of transgender individuals within the prison system. With the support of her attorneys from the MacArthur Justice Center at Northwestern University, Dion filed two lawsuits against the IDOC. These lawsuits not only sought justice for her own experiences, but also aimed to bring about systemic change to protect the rights and well-being of all transgender inmates. Through her legal actions, Dion hoped to raise awareness about the widespread abuse faced by transgender individuals in the prison system. She believed that by shining a light on her own experiences, she could expose the flaws and injustices within the system and pave the way for meaningful reform. One of the key aspects of Dayon's legal battle was to challenge the default practice of housing individuals based on their genitalia rather than considering other factors required by federal law. This practice disregards the gender identity of transgender individuals and contributes to their mistreatment and discrimination within the prison system. Dayon's lawsuits garnered a attention and support from advocates and activists across the country. Her story became a rallying cry for justice, highlighting the urgent need for change within the IDOC and other correctional institutions. The impact of Dayon's legal actions was felt not only within the courtroom, but also in the broader prison system. As a result of her lawsuits, a federal judge ordered training on transgender care for employees of the IDOC. This training aimed to educate staff members about the unique needs and challenges faced by transgender inmates, fostering a more inclusive and compassionate environment. Dion's legal actions have also had a ripple effect beyond her case. Her attorneys at the MacArthur Justice Center are representing two other transgender inmates in separate lawsuits against the Illinois prison system. Together, they are working to create a precedent that will protect the rights and well-being of all transgender individuals in custody. The spokesperson for the Illinois Department of Corrections could not comment on the pending lawsuits, but they denied that prison placement is solely based on a person's gender at birth. Trans resource navigator Reina Ortiz, who works closely with transgender inmates at Cook County Jail, has been a vocal advocate for Dion and others like her. Ortiz has witnessed firsthand the despair and mistreatment that transgender inmates endure within the prison system. She has been meeting with trans inmates to provide support and guidance. 
discussing topics ranging from healthcare to LGBTQ history. While Dion's experiences highlight the systemic issues within the prison system, Ortiz emphasizes the need for support and advocacy not only within the walls of the prison, but also within the broader community. Dion Hampton's past may be marked by unimaginable abuse and mistreatment, but she refuses to let those experiences define her future. With her release from prison, Dion is determined to build a life filled with hope, resilience, and advocacy. Karen White. Next, Karen White, a transgender woman who found herself at the center of a series of disturbing events during her time in prison. Despite not having undergone surgery or hormone treatment, White was sent to HMP New Hall, a women's prison in West Yorkshire. Her presence in the prison resulted in a reign of terror as she sexually assaulted multiple female inmates. To truly understand the shocking events that unfolded during Karen White's time in prison, it is essential to delve into her background and the decision to place her in a women's prison. Born as Stephen Wood, White's journey to becoming a transgender woman was marked by a history of criminal behavior and sexual offenses. White's criminal record included convictions for pedophilia, rape, and other sexual offenses against women. These heinous acts had earned her a reputation as a dangerous and predatory individual. Despite this, when White was remanded in custody for grievous bodily harm, the decision was made to place her in HMP New Hall, a women's prison in West Yorkshire. The decision to house White in a women's prison was based on the principle of self-identification as a woman. Despite not having undergone any surgical or hormonal changes, White was allowed to be placed in the female prison estate. This decision was made by a local transgender case board consisting of prison managers and psychologists who determined that White's self-identification as a woman was sufficient grounds for her placement. However, the board failed to take into account White's previous crimes and the potential risks she posed to the female inmates. None of the women at HMP Newhall were informed that White, a six-foot-tall individual with a deep voice, was a man identifying as a woman. The lack of warning and transparency created a volatile and dangerous environment within the prison walls. The decision to place White in a women's prison also raised questions about the privileges she was granted. While other inmates were not allowed access to the internet or the ability to purchase makeup and wigs, White was given special privileges to do so. This discrepancy in treatment further fueled the outrage and frustration among the female prisoners. The consequences of this decision became apparent as White embarked on a three-month reign of terror within HMP New Hall. She sexually assaulted multiple female inmates, leaving a trail of trauma and fear in her wake. Cheryl Kempton, one of White's victims, bravely spoke out about the abuse she endured and the lack of protection provided by the prison authorities. Kempton's account shed light on the manipulative and predatory nature of White's actions. She believed that White had faked being transgender as a means to exploit and prey on vulnerable women. Kempton's statements, along with those of other victims, formed a crucial part of the Crown Prosecution Service's case against White. Kempton recalled the size, height, and deep voice of the new inmate, which immediately set off alarm bells among the women. The presence of a man identifying as a woman in their midst created an atmosphere of discomfort and unease. Even the toughest of the inmates felt vulnerable and uncomfortable in White's presence. The sexual assaults perpetrated by White left a profound impact on the victims. Kempton revealed that White's conversations were often centered around sex, creating an environment of constant tension and fear. The victims, already imprisoned and stripped of their freedom, now had to contend with the added trauma of sexual assault. The physical differences between White and the female inmates further exacerbated the power dynamics at play. Kempton emphasized that White possessed a manly body, and it was a stark reminder that men are generally stronger than women. The knowledge that White could overpower them, if given the opportunity, only intensified the fear and vulnerability experienced by the victims. The revelations of the sexual assaults prompted Kempton and others to make formal complaints against White. However, they felt that the authorities had prioritized protecting White over the well-being of the female inmates. This further compounded the sense of injustice and betrayal felt by the victims. The Crown Prosecution Service's case against White, which included the testimonies of the victims, shed light on the extent of the abuse they suffered. In October 2018, White admitted to two sexual assaults on female prisoners at Leeds Crown Court. The acknowledgement of their experiences in a court of law was a small step towards justice for the victims. The shocking revelations of Karen White's sexual assaults on female inmates at HMP Newhall sparked outrage and raised serious questions about the response of the prison authorities. The lack of warning and transparency regarding White's true identity, coupled with the failure to protect the victims, led to a significant backlash and demands for accountability. After the first sexual assault, Cheryl Kempton, one of White's victims, was asked by a prison officer to make a formal complaint. However, Kempton, perhaps overwhelmed by the traumatic experience, declined to do so. It was only after another assault occurred that Kempton decided to come forward and make a formal complaint against White. The response of the prison authorities to the sexual assaults was met with criticism and accusations of prioritizing the protection of White over the safety of female inmates. Kempton and others felt that they had been let down by the system, which failed to adequately address the risks posed by White's presence.
presence in the women's prison. Following the formal complaint made by Kempton and the discovery of another sexual assault by White, the authorities took action. White was transferred from HMP Newhall to HMP Armley, an all-male prison in Leeds, while the police conducted an investigation into the allegations. The Ministry of Justice issued an apology for the decision to place White in HMP Newhall without considering her previous offending history. The case of Karen White Aldo prompted a broader discussion about the placement of transgender individuals in the prison system, Carla Bello. Next, I'll delve into the life of transgender woman Carla Bello, who endured a harrowing experience during her 11-day stay in Pinellas County Jail. As Carla Bello stepped into the confines of Pinellas County Jail, little did she know that her identity and sense of self would be stripped away from her. Despite being a transgender woman, Carla found herself housed with male inmates, a situation that would have a profound impact on her physical and emotional well-being. From the moment she entered the jail, Carla was subjected to constant misgendering and dead naming. Despite informing the jail staff about her gender identity, they persisted in referring to her by her birth name and using male pronouns. This deliberate disregard for her true identity was not only painful, but also a clear violation of her rights. The experience of being housed with male inmates was a constant source of fear and anxiety for Carla. She was forced to share living quarters with individuals who did not understand or respect her gender identity. The lack of understanding and acceptance from her fellow inmates created a hostile environment, leaving Carla feeling vulnerable and unsafe. One of the most egregious violations of Carla Bello's rights during her time in Pinellas County Jail was the denial of her hormone medication. As a transgender woman, hormone therapy was an essential part of Carla's transition and played a crucial role in her physical and mental well-being. However, the jail staff claimed that she could not have her hormones because she did not have a prescription for them, a common issue faced by individuals without access to proper health care. The abrupt cessation of hormone treatment had severe consequences for Carla. The withdrawal effects she experienced were not only physically distressing, but also posed a significant risk to her mental health. Without the hormones her body had become accustomed to, Carla faced the possibility of experiencing life-threatening withdrawal symptoms. The sudden hormonal imbalance could lead to severe depression, anxiety, and even suicidal thoughts. The denial of hormone medication not only had immediate effects, but also long-term consequences for Carla's transition. Hormone therapy is a critical component of gender-affirming care for transgender individuals. It helps them align their physical characteristics with their gender identity, alleviating gender dysphoria and improving overall well-being. By denying Carla access to her hormones, the jail staff effectively halted her transition process, causing distress and hindering her ability to live authentically. Furthermore, the denial of hormone medication was a clear violation of Carla's constitutional rights. The Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution prohibits the infliction of cruel and unusual punishment. By withholding necessary medical treatment, the jail staff subjected Carla to unnecessary suffering and jeopardized her health and safety. Where am I supposed to change? Um, I'm supposed to be on hormones. And it started to affect me um, in so many different ways and it's so layered. Another distressing aspect of Carla's experience was the forcible confiscation of her personal items. If caught wearing a bra under her jail clothes, it was immediately taken away from her as contraband. This act of confiscation not only violated her right to self-expression, but also served as a constant reminder of the disregard for her gender identity. Her bra was treated as if it posed a threat within the confines of the jail. In addition to the confiscation of her bra, Carla was denied access to other personal items that were integral to her sense of self. She lost the ability to wear makeup, a form of self-expression and empowerment for many individuals. The denial of makeup further contributed to the erasure of Carla's gender identity and made her feel invisible within the prison walls. Furthermore, she was not allowed to have her hair extensions, which played a significant role in her self-confidence and helped her feel more aligned with her true self. These seemingly small acts of confiscation and denial may appear insignificant to some, but for Carla, they had a profound impact on her well-being. The loss of these personal belongings stripped away her ability to express herself authentically and reinforced the message that her identity was not valid or respected within the prison system. The impact of being housed with male inmates and the subsequent mistreatment took a toll on Carla's mental health. She found herself in a state of despair, contemplating suicide as a means of escape from the dehumanizing conditions she was subjected to. They, they stripped me of everything. They took everything from me. However, recent developments in some areas, such as the case in New York, resulting in a strong jail policy protecting the rights of transgender inmates, demonstrate that progress is possible. This policy covers housing placement, safety, medication access, pronoun use, search procedures, and grooming standards, providing a model for other facilities to follow. Advocacy groups and organizations, such as the New York Civil Liberties Union, are actively working to promote the rights of transgender individuals within the criminal justice system. They are pushing for comprehensive policies that address the 
the specific needs of transgender inmates, ensuring their safety, well-being, and dignity. Carla Bello's story sheds light on the mistreatment faced by transgender women in prisons. Isla Bryson. Next, we'll delve into the life of Isla Bryson, a 31-year-old Scottish transgender woman from Clydebank, Dunbartonshire, who made headlines when she was convicted of the rape of two women. These crimes occurred prior to Bryson's gender transition when she was still presenting as male. Isla Bryson's journey from a small town in Clydebank, Dunbartonshire, to a prison cell began with a series of disturbing and criminal actions. In 2016 and 2019, prior to Bryson's gender transition, she committed the heinous crime of rape against two women. These acts of violence occurred while Bryson was still presenting as male, under the name Adam Binney Bryson. The first victim, whom Bryson met on the dating website Badu, testified during the trial about her harrowing experience. Unbeknownst to her, Bryson had a hidden agenda. Under the guise of Adam Graham, Bryson gained her trust and then violated her in September 2016. The second victim, who encountered Bryson on the social media app Bigo, shared a similar story of manipulation and abuse, with the rape occurring in June 2019. Both victims showed immense courage in coming forward to seek justice for the trauma they had endured. In July 2019, Bryson's crimes caught up with her when she appeared in court under the name Adam Graham and was formally charged. However, it was during this time that Bryson began the process of gender transition, choosing to become a transgender woman. In 2020, Bryson assumed the name Isla Annie Bryson in court, reflecting her true identity. As the legal proceedings unfolded, Bryson's transition became a significant factor in the case. The defense argued that Bryson's status as a person undergoing the transitioning process made her vulnerable. They claimed that her actions were not those of a predatory male, but rather a person grappling with their own identity. However, the prosecution painted a different picture. Advocate Deputy John Keenan Casey described Bryson as a predator who had preyed on two vulnerable female partners after meeting them online. The prosecution argued that Bryson's gender transition did not excuse or diminish the severity of her crimes. After a six-day trial held in January 2023 at the High Court of Justiciary in Glasgow, Bryson's fate was sealed. She was convicted of the rape on January 24th, 2023. This landmark conviction made Bryson the first transgender woman in Scotland to be found guilty of such a heinous crime. Presiding Judge Lord Scott warned Bryson that she faced a significant custodial sentence. The gravity of her actions was undeniable, and the court recognized the need for justice to be served. Following her conviction, Bryson was arrested and charged as a man by Police Scotland. Her crimes would be recorded as having been committed by a man, reflecting the legal gender assigned to her at birth. Now here's where things get tricky. Initially, Bryson was remanded to a women's prison to await sentencing. The placement of Isla Bryson, a transgender woman, in a women's prison ignited a firestorm of controversy and raised important questions about the treatment of transgender individuals within the prison system. While some argued that Bryson should be housed according to her gender identity, others expressed concerns about the potential risks and safety of other inmates. However, it is important to note that Bryson was segregated from the general prison population pending a risk assessment. This precautionary measure aimed to ensure the safety of both Bryson and the other inmates. The risk assessment would determine whether Bryson should remain in a women's prison or be transferred to a more suitable facility. The controversy surrounding Bryson's placement in a women's prison also sparked a broader debate about the rights and needs of transgender prisoners. Advocates argued that transgender individuals should be housed according to their gender identity, as this aligns with their sense of self and promotes their mental well-being. They emphasized the importance of treating transgender prisoners with dignity and respect, ensuring their safety and protection from discrimination. On the other hand, opponents of Bryson's placement in a women's prison raised concerns about the potential for abuse and exploitation. They argued that allowing a convicted rapist, regardless of gender identity, to be housed with vulnerable women could lead to further victimization. They called for a more nuanced approach that takes into account the specific circumstances and risks involved. The controversy surrounding Bryson's case also had political implications. It became a focal point for criticism of the Scottish Parliament's gender recognition reform, Scotland, Bill. Even though the bill was not in effect at the time of Bryson's crimes, critics argued that the case highlighted the potential dangers of a more liberal approach to gender recognition and raised questions about the balance between individual rights and public safety. In response to the public outcry and concerns raised, the Scottish Prison Service announced an urgent review of transgender cases within its prisons. This review aimed to assess the policies and procedures surrounding the placement of transgender prisoners and ensure that appropriate measures were in place to address the specific needs and risks involved. During the review process, the movement of transgender prisoners was paused to allow for a thorough examination of the existing protocols. The goal was to develop a more comprehensive and informed approach to the placement of transgender individuals in the prison system. After the review, it was announced that transgender prisoners would be initially accommodated according to their sex assigned at
at birth. This approach aimed to ensure the safety and well-being of all individuals involved, while a more thorough assessment was carried out to determine whether placement in a men's or women's prison was more appropriate. California State Men's Prison, Vacaville. Finally, to understand the lives of trans women even better, let's go to the California State Men's Prison, Vacaville. In recent years, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, CDCR, has faced the challenge of accommodating a growing number of offenders who do not fit into a binary gender classification system. Senate Bill 132, known as the Transgender Respect, Agency and Dignity Act, allows incarcerated individuals to be housed in a correctional facility designated for men or women based on their preferences. However, in the challenging environment of California State Men's Prison in Vacaville, transgender women face a multitude of unique challenges. The prison system, like most others, has long been structured along traditional gender lines, with separate facilities for men and women. For the roughly two dozen transgender women, living alongside nearly 2,500 men in Vacaville's state prison, the challenges are not only experienced by the women themselves, but also by the prison staff responsible for their safety. These women navigate a complex web of gender identity, expression, and acceptance within the confines of the prison walls. One of the transgender women, Jazzy Paradise Scott, has been taking hormones since she was 16. Despite having the approval of her parents to live as a trans woman, she acknowledges the mistakes that led her to prison. Scott reflects on her journey, stating, I've always had my mom and my father's approval of being a trans woman, so I've never had to fight with them on those issues. It was just always about getting my life together and make, stop making so many careless mistakes like this ending up in prison, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the challenges faced by transgender women in prison extend beyond their gender identity and expression. They are at a higher risk of harassment, hatred, and violence, both inside and outside the prison walls. Yekaterina Wesa Patience, another transgender woman, shares her experience of feeling like a girl since childhood. However, her family could not accept her identity, leading to physical abuse in an attempt to make her conform to societal expectations. Patience's journey took her from leaving home at 14 to eventually ending up in prison for first-degree murder at the age of 18. Inside the prison, the violence against transgender women continues. Patience reveals that she was raped twice by other prisoners, leading her to adopt a more masculine persona as a means of self-protection. She reflects on her experiences, stating, I immediately cut all my hair off, grew facial hair, and never grew it long again. I had to act like the toughest person I could find. The statistics paint a grim picture of the challenges faced by transgender prisoners. A study conducted by UC Irvine researchers found that transgender prisoners are 13 times more likely to be sexually assaulted than their cisgender counterparts. This alarming statistic becomes even more striking when considering that transgender prisoners make up only about 1% of the total prison population in California. In response to the pressing need for greater safety and accommodation, California's prison system has implemented changes. In 2015, a lawsuit brought by transgender inmate Shiloh Quine led to the allowance of access to apparel previously reserved for female prisoners at women's prisons. This includes items like bras, clothing, makeup, and jewelry. Similar policies were also put in place for transgender men at women's prisons. Despite the unique challenges faced by transgender women in California State Men's Prison, Vacaville, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, CDCR, has taken steps to provide support services and resources for these individuals. The CDCR has designated certain prisons as hubs for transgender inmates, where these individuals can access specialized support and resources. One such hub is the California Medical Facility, CMF, the prison in Vacaville. CMF not only serves as a hub for transgender inmates, but also caters to the medical and mental health needs of its residents. This designation allows transgender women to have better access to healthcare services, including hormone therapy and gender-affirming care. Jazzy Paradise. Scott, a transgender woman serving her third prison term, has been actively involved in advocating for the rights and well-being of transgender prisoners. Scott was elected to represent other transgender prisoners on the Inmate Advisory Council, giving her a platform to voice their concerns and fight for their rights. Through her efforts, she successfully lobbied for the creation of a weekly workout club specifically for transgender women, with a prison staffer serving as a fitness coach. The workout club provides a safe and inclusive environment for transgender women to exercise and express themselves freely. It allows them to let their hair down, wear makeup, gym shorts, and sports bras, creating a space where they can feel comfortable and empowered. The women participate in activities such as brisk walks, stationary biking, and half-court basketball, promoting physical fitness and overall well-being. 
being, the creation of the Workout Club was not without its challenges. Scott reflects on the journey, stating, It took a long journey with a long fight, but I was able to work with staff on talking to the right people to get it done. In addition to the Workout Club, support groups have been established to provide a space for transgender prisoners to come together, share their experiences, and offer support to one another. During one of these support group meetings, Carrie C.J. Smith expressed her love for makeup, showcasing her collection of lip gloss and mascara. The ability to access and use makeup is one of the small luxuries that help transgender women feel more like themselves and maintain a sense of normalcy within the prison environment. While progress has been made in providing support services and resources, there are still institutional barriers that need to be addressed. The road is long and mistakes will definitely be made. The prison system in general still has to find the right way to navigate these complex issues. Thanks for watching. Click on the videos on the screen for similar content.